You know, as I walked out and saw the chair there, I didn't know it was part of a set. I thought it was, they took that, they realized I was 86 years old and probably couldn't stand unsupported for 18 minutes. But we're gonna test that theory today. <laughs> the, the reason being, you know, at age 86, I belong to that part of the octogenarian generation that's not looking for a smartphone. They're looking for a cell phone that has a rotary dial in it. <laughs> uh, my style has to always been stand up. I would talk without notes. I've never sat down during a talk. That is until last summer when Corning Incorporated in, endowed me with the means to make a series of 40 arithmetic videotapes that will be used by elementary school teachers to help them have another method to help their students learn math in a better way. Uh, I apologize again for not being able to really use the modern technology, but I rely on what I hope is a warm and user-friendly, I was going to say dialogue, but for the moment monologue. Uh, you men they mentioned my MIT videotapes. They've now been viewed by over a million people on YouTube alone. And the way they were made was back in the 1970s, late 60s and early 70s, when except for state-of-the-art commercial video networks, uh, everything was in black and white talking head. Editing meant you either do it over or let it go as it is. And those videotapes, when, they, when MIT decided to digitize them three years ago and put them up on the internet, I was petrified that today's sophisticated audience wouldn't look at them. And I tell you this story for two reasons. First of all, it gives you credibility that I know something about mathematics. And secondly, I hope it emphasizes the fact that it's the delivery system. It's how we teach people. It's how we relate to them not how well the subject is produced on video, okay? We'll talk about that in more detail. And uh, what I'd like to bring up is that in getting started, I've been teaching since 1953. I've seen the new math, the old math, the in-between math, program instruction, you name it, I've seen it. I think right now it's Common Core. And the statistics have remained the same that half the students who take developmental math either don't finish it, or when they do finish it, they don't pass their first credit course. So the idea that I was thinking about is, uh, what should I talk about? The two words that seem to be going around at the moment are common core, which is a delivery system, and the word enumeracy, which dictates a problem. Now, I didn't know what enumeracy meant, but I assumed that it was the mathematical version of illiteracy. And if illiteracy means that you can't read, Enumeracy means you can't do computations. And if that's true, that should have been the slogan in my generation, not this one. In my generation, we wouldn't have talked about drill and kill. In fact, we didn't have slogans in my generation. Okay. A slogan would have been drill and survive. There were no calculators. You had to be accurate with pencil and paper. Who cared whether you understood why? Just get the right answer. Today, with the advent of the calculator, that has replaced the need for paper and pencil computation. If I remember from my youth, say, that I once learned how to divide two fractions, and now I have to divide them again, but I don't remember how to do it. I say, I know I have to invert and multiply, but which one do I invert? If I'm liberal, I'll invert the one on the left. If I'm conservative, the one on the right. <laughs> and if I'm an equal opportunity, I'll invert both of them. <laughs> Thank God for Google. All I have to do is type in solve dividing two fractions. And I'll get about 50 pages of references. And I can even pick my own instructor, somebody who's on the same wavelength that I am. Have you ever watched? The program, I think it's called, Do You Want to Be a Millionaire? I only w watched it once. And I discovered a remarkable thing. 
you could become the millionaire very easily just by when they ask you, who would you pick for your lifeline, you pick Google. <laughs> Every single answer is on Google. So if your only problem is in numeracy, buy a calculator. I think they give them away at banks now if you sign up for some kind of, they, they give them, they're cheap. Why make a kid waste six years of his life in elementary school to learn what he can get for $5.98? <laughs> and it's loyal, it's there when he wants to use it. But with the calculator came a problem that I don't hear people talking about. Going back to the analogy of illiteracy, I would, don't they also, also talk about functional illiteracy? That's people who can read, but they don't understand what they're reading. So I want to talk about functional innumeracy. These are the people who can compute, but they don't know how or when to do it. You see, even today, we have something better than just handheld calculators. We have optical scanners that can scan a difficult equation and not only answer it, give you the answer, it will print out every step, step by step. What that optical scanner won't do is to tell you where that equation came from and under what conditions it's valid to use it. And, that, and that's basically the part that we should be using to, in helping to teach students, okay? To me, all these modern technological devices are a wonderful delivery system. But if you don't put in the right information, it reminds me of one of my favorite topics when I give a talk that's called, if you deliver stale donuts in a Rolls Royce, it doesn't make the donuts any fresher. <laughs> We've specialized in making a better Rolls Royce. We have not specialized, in, in my opinion, we have not specialized in terms of getting people to know when do we do this, uh, when don't we do this. Let me give you an example from my own generation, probably a little bit dampened obscured, deformed by age, uh, maybe a slight exaggeration, but basically the way I remember it. <laughs> there were no calculators, so teachers gave us what they called keywords. They said, if you hear the word add, if you see the word sum, S-U-M, it's telling you it's an addition problem. Okay? Easy to remember? Okay. Now I remember that. And I'm given the question, what must you add to three to get five? Ah, as a sum. I heard the word add. I heard the word sum. The only two numbers I see are three and five. What do I do? I add them. Maybe some of you did. You maybe didn't hear what, what the question was. So they get eight for the answer. And clearly, three plus eight is not five, except for very large values of five. <laughs> you see, the calc... If that person had a calculator, they would still get the problem wrong. Because the question they were thinking of is, how much is the sum of three plus five? That's the question the calculator heard, okay? And that's the question the calculator answered. Unfortunately, it wasn't the answer to the problem that the student wanted to have answered. To paraphrase the NRA, Calculators don't make mistakes. The people who punch the numbers in do. <laughs> so here's the problem I was faced with. There was a third reason I want, I'm happy he mentioned the MIT videos. Because even though my international reputation, being what it is, it's, I would actually classify, classify myself as a cult hero people who watched this black and white ancient production saying it was wonderful. I, mean, I, I couldn't believe it anyway. My first love has always been to teach people who really need my help. I love teaching at MIT, but there wasn't one kid there who couldn't survive without me. I didn't realize till I came as the founding department chair, math department chair at Corning back in 1958, I wasn't even aware that I never taught math at MIT. I just told the kids. People would say to me, what style of instruction do you prefer, self-paced or uh, traditional classroom? I said, at MIT, we didn't use either. It was called winging it. <laughs> you didn't have to teach. When I left 
MIT to come to Corning, people said, be careful, Herb, the kids at Corning are not going to be like your MIT students. And I said, don't worry, I had bad students at MIT too. <laughs> Little realizing that they were the lower half of the top 2% in the nation. And that's who's making our decisions in education today, people who have never experienced the problem. They're not, you don't see a welfare mother on a committee that's designed to see what's fair for welfare mothers. And I don't think you saw any elementary school teachers or community college professors on presidential summits as to how we solve the problems of math education in the elementary school. See, I, I knew nothing about No Child Left Behind until it was already published. And of course, you, children will always be left behind. They'll always be a lower half. We, are kids who are left, we have kids who are left behind from the day they enter kindergarten because they were put into a safe place in place of preschool. They were given safe, what do you call it, kept away from harm's way while other kids went to preschool. These kids come into school knowing their numbers. They know the alphabet. Other kids have never seen this. And the gap never closes in a way. So this is what I was faced with. The students who had slipped through the cracks in K through 12 in math. I wasn't worried about whether they were going to become great mathematicians or scientists or not. STEM is great for that 30% of the kids who are going into a math science field. It's not great for the 70% who aren't. You see, the kids I had didn't like math. And by the way, when I say kids, it means from ages 17 up to beyond my age when you're talking about community college. And they have a great coping me mechanism. That coping mechanism says, why do I have to know this? Where am I ever going to use it? See, if I can't be good at something, let me at least believe that what I was bad at wasn't worth knowing in the first place. Okay? Khan Academy. Wonderful for kids who want to know how to solve a problem. In my humble opinion, it doesn't do a thing for the kid who says, why do I have to know this? And that's what we're not doing enough of in math today. So that was the problem I was faced with. Kids who were saying, why do I have to know this? And it reminded me, I've never seen a college that has a department called Math and Humanities. You have math science, you have math computer science, whatever you want, math engineering. No, I don't know of any math humanities. And it occurred to me that engineers and scientists never talk about numbers. Or let's put it a different way. Their vision of a number is completely different from a mathematician's vision of a number. They visualize a number as a quantity. It's an adjective. They don't say three. It's either three inches, three feet, three pounds. Think of what happens when you put the noun in for the number to modify. Are a million and a billion both big numbers? Yeah, a lot of zeros after them. Well, let them modify seconds. A million seconds is less than 12 days. A billion seconds is more than 31 years. Who's ever confused 12 days with 31 years? Can we hear, imagine one of my prison inmates who's taking one of my math courses saying, Herb, I wasn't paying attention when they sentenced me. The judge either gave me 12 days or 31 years, something like that. <laughs> and by the way, that makes a million seem small. It won't be a million days since the birth of Jesus till the 28th century. Now, do you have to know math to be awestruck by that kind of a statement? I don't think so. A trillion is even a bigger number, right? A trillion is what? A one followed by 12 zeros. It's got to be big. Well, how big is it? Well, remember, a trillion is a thousand billions. And if a billion seconds is 31 years, a trillion seconds is 31,000 years. So if you want to live to be a trillion years old, you're going to have to walk on eggshells for a long, long time. Okay? And if you put it in terms of money, if you were a philanthropist giving away $1,000 24-7 without stopping, it would be over 31 years before you gave away a trillion dollars. And if you want a more... Big number, if you were a philanthropist giving away a million dollars every second without stopping, it would be over 10 days before you give away that much money. Can you begin to fantasize what that money could do domestically? 
I won't go into any politics here, but I think you can see the point that I'm trying to make this way. And it's even greater when you come to fractions. I've heard students say math was easy till I got to fractions. Oh, by the way, I left out my best line. That is one of the problems of not having a script. How many times have you heard a student say, I was great in math, I could do everything except the word problems? <laughs> in the textbook of life, there are only word problems. That was the biggest admission to me that, what do we call it? Functional innumeracy existed. What was the best? I could do all of the math except the word problems. What was the math for? To solve word problems. Okay? You know, so, so we're on the same page so far. So now we have common core. Okay. Oh, I was talking about fractions. Yeah. Let me tell you about fractions. Think about this as a thought question. If teen, T-E-N, means to add 10, why does the first teen come after 12 instead of after 10? Why wasn't 11 called one teen? And the reason was that people didn't like fractions. And when they had nouns, they could have the noun take the place of the fraction. We don't talk about 1 60th of an hour, we say a minute. So what we mathematicians did is we invented an infinite set of new nouns. They were called halves, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, etc. And what did the sixth mean? One of what it took six of. What did the twelfth mean? One of what it took twelve of. There was no problem this way. In the same way that somebody says, how much is, you have three A's and two B's on your report card, you don't say I had five A-B's. You find a common denomination. In colleges, it's called the GPA, OK? Uh, if you have three dimes and two nickels and you want to convert them to how much money you have, you have to find a common denomination. So if I, if I see sevenths and fifths as nouns and I want to add three sevenths and two fifths, I know I have to have a common denomination. When I see it as three over seven plus two over five, all I see are four disconnected numbers and I add a cross. You follow what I'm driving at? I take, I'm so long-winded that I've run out of time already, which is fine. You can read more about what I'm doing if, you, if you're interested by just Googling my name, Herb Gross, Math is a Second Language. And I've just been delighted to be here to talk to you. I got carried away by the honor at age 86, being allowed to give a TED Talk, forgot what I wanted, not forgot what I wanted to talk about, dwell too long on parts that I wanted to skim over. But I was delighted to be with you today and just thank you for your attention. And uh, I, I was just very, very gratified. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>